President Trump is complaining about all this. From, from where you see it from the ports, are you, are you seeing shipping less to China, perhaps more divergence in, in South America? What are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, we're, we're definitely not seeing a lot of, of soybeans coming out of the U.S. You know, right now we would start to come into peak uh, U.S. soybean exports, and we just haven't seen a lot of uh, volumes movement moved. But what we have seen are increased volumes coming out of Brazil, which is the exact same thing that happened last year to make up for the, the lack of, uh, of product coming out of the U.S. The other interesting thing is last year Argentina went through a drought. This year they've actually got a healthy crop of both soybeans and corn. So we're seeing again more shipments coming out of uh, the east coast of South America. Yeah, I think a lot of questions before when, when the soybean issue was, was, was first brought up about 16 months ago was how quickly that process of substitution would be able to take place. It happened fairly quickly, more quickly than a lot of people thought. So my question to you is if, if indeed these uh, sanctions get lifted, these tariffs or, 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 or the relationship improves, does, do you think that quickly shifts back? Yeah, I, I do. I do. I mean, the U.S. has some some weather issues. We've had a lot of rain, so the crop itself may not be as big as as what was anticipated even last year. Mm. But again, you have Brazil and Argentina. What's interesting, if you look at the numbers for Brazil last year, usually they ship about 60 to 65 percent of their production and then use the rest for internal demand. Right. Last year, they shipped almost 90% of their product out of Brazil to China. And again, that was because of the lack of, uh, of soybeans coming out of the U.S. Uh, there's one thing, it's seasonal, then people say yeah, it has something to do with politics as well. I'm just wondering, you know, Cargill just came out and they were talking about how if, if this U.S.-China trade war keeps going and it prolongs uh, the way that it is right now, this becomes much more of a permanent shift when it comes to trade flows. Do you see this as being a new normal? On the soybean front, I mean, as, as you said, it really depends on what China decides to do in, in terms of buying soybeans and, and corn from mm. the U.S. What are you seeing in other commodities then? So in other commodities, on the iron ore side, we've seen steel production up 10 percent in China this year so far. So we've seen a real increase of, uh, of iron ore exports. Big focus out of Australia. We obviously had in the beginning part of the year the unfortunate uh, incident with Valet and, and the dam collapse, but we've now started to see a slow recovery of, uh, of iron ore exports out of Brazil and going into China. So what we've seen on our large ships because of all that is rates move from $8,000 a day to over $26,000 a day over the last wow. three months. And what typically happens this time of year is you always have a slow start in the first half of the year, and that's a seasonal um, piece. You have, you have maintenance that goes on, on on the mining side, and it's a slower period of time. Typically, the second half of the year, you have anywhere from 12 to 15 percent more in iron ore shipments the second half over the first half. If you couple that with the fact that where the price of iron ore is over $100 today, Valley is very incentivized to try to get their mining operations up and going as fast as they can. And we're now starting to see the increased volumes. John. OK, Baltic Dry Index, we, we look at that, used to be seen as a gauge for how the global trade environment was. But leaving that to one side, we've got it at the highest levels that we've seen in five years, this Baltic Dry Index. What are yes. you shipping the most? Is it actually iron ore? Because China still has all that infrastructure build out, and that infrastructure build out is all part of stimulus, isn't it? Does it tell us anything about the state of global trade right now? You know, so it's, that's always the big misnomer with the Baltic Dry Index. So yes, we've seen a real recovery on the demand side, which has been led by iron ore, coal, and bauxite. Um, but what we've also seen in dry bulk shipping is a very low order book. So a very small number of ships that are delivering on a, year, on a yearly basis. So that has also helped push our rates up. And if we look out the next 18, to two, 18 months to two years, we have a very good sense of how many ships are actually coming in, into, uh, into the market. And from a historical standpoint, it's very low numbers. John, one of the biggest... Uh cycles in, in shipping is that uh, when times are good, people order a lot more ships. Are you ordering more ships at the moment? Because what happens then, and you know 20 times better than me, that then you end up with this huge surfeit of ships, this whole surplus of ships as well. So, you know, this de demand and supply and whether you're fit for purpose or right size is always the, 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 the trick you've got to try and pull off. 
Yeah, look, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we are a big proponent of, of asking people to not order ships. <laughs> um, and so what, if you look at what Genco has done, last year we actually acquired six ships, but they were secondhand 2015 and 2016 built ships that are very fuel efficient, that go along with our plan of, of reducing our, uh, our fuel exposure and, and our fuel burn. Um, but I think there, it's interesting what's happened right now with shipyards is most of them are absolutely full. They're building a lot of tankers, they're building a lot of gas ships and a lot of container ships. So the, the availability to even go and order a dry bulk ship today is, uh, it still takes about two years out from now. We've also seen a real um, shrinking on the financing side, particularly with European banks and typically finance this industry. So that has been helpful to companies like Genco who really don't want to see a lot of new building orders anymore. Mm. Um, and, and so it's much more difficult and there's higher barriers to entry, if you will, in terms of ordering new ships. Uh, and I guess that all plays into IMO 2020 as well. How have you shifted your strategy now? Maybe not in terms of new ships, but in terms of installing scrubbers, for example, or actually more scrapping. Have you sped up that process too? We haven't sped up uh, our scrapping process, so we have been selling our older assets. So last year we, uh, we sold a lot of our 98 and 99 built Panamaxes because they are less fuel efficient. That's why we acquired six, six new ships that are highly fuel efficient. But we've taken, I would say, a more uh, robust approach in that we are installing scrubber systems on our large Cape size ships, which are shipping iron ore and coal, and those are long haul trade routes. We will be burning compliant fuel on our medium size and smaller ships. And, but we've also done a lot on data collection. And so we've been installing systems on our ships to really measure on a real time basis our fuel burn and being able to manage that and being able to really reduce, if you will, our carbon footprint as well as uh, our fuel expenses. How much is it all costing you? Just ballpark. And do you get a sense that you'll pass it on to your, to your, to your clients next year? Well, look, our, our scrubber systems are costing, you know, the system itself as well as the installation a little more than $2 million a ship. And as we look at it, you know, from an economic standpoint, we basically recoup that investment over a 12-month period. 